and the lead and the leader. So I've thought about that a lot. Why, why is there this connection between extraordinary leadership and love and compassion? Well, I think there's a couple of things. Number one, leadership is influence. That's what leaders do. You're all going to be leaders in your own right. And your main responsibility is to influence other people. Now, I'm a math major, and I'm fairly analytical, and I can write good op orders, and I can put together plans that would water your eyes. Okay, I can do all those things. But I've learned that's not what inspires people. What inspires people is the influence that you have in their lives. And love is one of the channels that enables that influence to occur. When I was the special assistant to the head of NASA after the Space Shuttle Challenger accident, that was the first of the two major problems that NASA had. One was Challenger, the second one was Columbia. Challenger was the O-ring problem with a low temperature launch at, in Florida. Dr. James Fletcher was brought in as the new NASA administrator and I had the honor of being his special assistant. I watched this man influence the entire organization to drive an organization that had a lot of different interests towards one objective, get the space shuttle flying again. He had to work with scientists who didn't particularly have an interest in that happening, other folks who were interested in rocket engines that had nothing to do with the space shuttle coming on back, but through his influence, he was able to transform that organization to get the space shuttle flying again. It was one of the most amazing things that I had seen. And he wasn't even that dynamic a person, but he genuinely cared about people, and it showed, and people responded. Leadership is influence. The second thing I've learned is our people, the people who work for us, our people want to feel special and valuable. Every single person that you'll have responsibility for wants to feel special and valuable, without exception. When I've been in the classroom over the years, one of the things I always do is I celebrate birthdays of the students who were in my class. Mr. Caps was one of my students, he might remember that. And what we used to do is, is at the beginning of the year, I'd get all the you know, information on the students, and one of the things was the birth date. And then I'd put that all in my calendar, and I kind of knew when things were coming up, and I'd buy them a little book, and we'd sing happy birthday in the classroom. Kind of corny, really. <laughs> but what I've learned over the years is that people like to be recognized on their birthday. Even the people who say, ah, I, don't, you know, I don't care my birthday, I, that doesn't matter. Even those people, they like to be recognized on their birthday. And I didn't make this up. Someone taught this to me when I was a young officer. And ever since that time, I've always celebrated the birthdays of those who've worked for me. Now, when I've had a large organization, I've had to narrow it down to those that are closest in the chain of command and those kinds of things. But it's just one of those ways where you say, hey, you're, you're special and valuable. Because I took the effort to figure out when your birthday was, remember it, and actually get you a little something. I mean, just yesterday, my deputy in the Stockdale Center, he's a big old tough Marine, you know, it's his birthday. Made a big deal out of it with him. He liked it. I can tell. Now, if you ask him, he's like, nah, I don't care about that. <laughs> hey, you don't have to celebrate people's birthdays, but you have to figure out ways as a leader to communicate that care and concern. So you pick your own way to do it. Just one of the ways that I have over the years. You know who Admiral Mike Mullen is? Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, kind of one of those high-ranking folks in the, in the military. Well, when I was a midshipman here, he was Lieutenant Mike Mullen. He was the executive assistant to the Commandant, and since I had a position where I had to deal with the Commandant a lot, I would typically have to spend a lot of time with Lieutenant Mike Mullen. And he gave me a lot of good advice. We had a, we had a great relationship. And then I graduated in 1978. I went my way, he went his way. About three years ago at the Army-Navy game, I mean, I hadn't seen Admiral Mike Mullen since that time, and my wife, Misty, I was dating at the time when I was in my first class year, so he had met her a couple times. But I had not seen him since 1978, and this was about three years ago. So he's at the Army-Navy game, and he has his entourage with him. You know, I mean, they're guys with binders and folders and briefcases and phones and guys with ear stuff and, you know, a huge group with him. And he's walking down one of those corridors that's around the stadium, 
and I'm getting ready to go in one of the tunnel areas to get to where my seat was, and I was with my wife, Misty. Admiral Mullen looks over, and I, I mean, I didn't even wave, because I didn't even know if he'd know who I was, and I figured that would be kind of dumb to be waving, and he's, who's that? <laughs> so I, I didn't even do that. He turns the whole entourage towards me, and he starts heading right for Misty and I. And you could see all the aides, they're all bothered because he's probably supposed to go see someone or whatever. And it's not easy turning one of those entourage. This is like an aircraft carrier, you know, to try to, <laughs> try to get that thing over. And he comes right up to me and he says, Art, I haven't seen you in a long time. I hear you're back at the Naval Academy and I hear you got a large family. That, that's great. Misty, so good to see you. Now, I know there wasn't some little aide, you know, who had this to slip him a piece of paper because they had no idea we would run into each other. But that man remembered. And he came over and made a big deal of it. I mean, who, who am I? This is the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He has a lot of people to see. That type of interaction always makes an impact. Always makes an impact. Because all of us want to feel special and valuable. So do your people who work for you. So leadership is influence. Our people want to feel special and valuable. Our people want to receive feedback in an atmosphere of genuine concern. Our people want to receive feedback in an atmosphere of genuine concern. One of the most important things you will do as a leader is give feedback to people, both good and bad. I've met a lot of leaders who just don't like to give feedback, either good or bad. They say nothing. I mean, you, you got to know this being on the receiving end of not having any feedback. It's frustrating. It keeps you in the dark. But great, extraordinary leaders give a lot of feedback, but in an atmosphere of genuine concern. I'm sure none of you midshipmen have ever been stopped like across the yard by somebody, you know, like your cover was tilted or something. Probably was a Marine, unfortunately. But, you know, the Marine yelled across the yard and then he comes after you, you know, and, and is that, okay, you're gonna listen, but how deep does that feedback really go? Not very deep at all. Because we accept feedback most often and most deeply from people we think who really care about us. That's where the feedback can make a change. When I was a Marine Corps major, I was at Marine Aviation Weapons and Tactics Squadron 1, which is the, the Marine Corps likes to say the Top Gun equivalent. It's actually much broader than Top Gun, but it's a specialized place. And I had this captain working for me. And he was a pretty good Marine officer, but he was very arrogant. And, and I thought his arrogance was affecting him both professionally and personally. So as part of my feedback, I decided I, I need to talk to him about this. So I brought him in. We talked about some pleasantries. I said some good things he was doing. And then I said, Bob, you know, let me lay out what I see. And I had some specific examples. Now, try telling someone who's arrogant that they're arrogant. Just see how far that normally goes. Normally it doesn't go very far, because one of the things arrogance does is it blinds you to your own condition. But I laid it out, and then I also gave him some things I thought he could do. Then I gave him some you know, encouragement at the end, and he goes out. And man, he walked out of that door as close as you can be to being respectful, but not really wanting to be, as he left. I mean, he was angry. So I watched him for the next three months or so, and he was already selected to be a major. So he now puts his major leafs on. Now we're both majors, though he still works for me. So he comes to me about three months after this meeting and he says, uh, Art, could I talk to you about when we uh, had that meeting about three months ago? I thought, man, here it comes. You know, he's gonna say, okay, you know, now that we're both majors, you know, that whole thing. Well, he didn't. He said, uh, let me tell you, when I walked out of your office, I was furious. I said, Bob, I kind of noticed that, uh, actually. <laughs> and he said, but I got home, and that night I had to think to myself, why did you tell me that? And he said, I was convinced you didn't tell me that because you wanted to look better. I was convinced you didn't tell me that because you wanted Mott's One to look better. I was convinced you didn't tell me that because you wanted the Marine Corps to look better. This was you cared about me, both personally and professionally. And he said, because of that, I took it seriously. And I had seen change, continue to see change in this man. But I think the only reason it worked or was accepted or at least considered was that it was feedback in an atmosphere of genuine concern. He knew I cared about him. 
So leadership is influence. Our people want to feel special and valuable. Our people want to receive feedback in an atmosphere of genuine concern. And our people also want to know they have a leader they can come to when they're facing adversity. They also want to know they have a leader they can come to when they are facing adversity. And typically, they don't feel that way if they don't sense you really care about them. When I was commandant at midshipman at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy, I had a first classman come to me. And uh, he sat down in my office and I said, how are things going? And he said, terrible. Now, I talked to enough midshipmen, you know, you, you sort of figure, okay, well, it's academics or sports or, you know, there's kind of a normal routine you go through in your mind of why he would say terrible. So I said, well, why? What, what's, what's going on? And he said, my father was murdered last night. That was not what I was expecting, for sure, in his answer. Uh, and actually, I've been around the block quite a bit, but I've never had someone who would tell me my father was murdered, had never crossed that bridge in my professional career. So we talked for about an hour, and then at the end, he said, uh, would you come to the memorial service that's going to be in two, two nights? I said, I'd, I'd be honored to come. So Misty and I came down to the chapel at the Merchant Marine Academy for the memorial service for this first classman's father. And I remember it's, it was going to start at 1900. At 1855, I'm kind of just looking around, and I don't know anybody there except this first classman. I didn't see the chaplains. I didn't see anybody who looked kind of officially religious in any way, form, or shape. I, was just, I, I just remember thinking that at about 1855. At 1900, this first classman comes up to me and he says, uh, Sir, whenever you're ready to, uh, to begin. I said, begin what? The memorial service. So here's a guy who just lost his dad, right? So I'm not about to say to him, what are you talking about? Like you didn't ask me to do, you asked me to come to the memorial service. That's not the same thing as do the memorial service. But I figured I can't say that to this guy. So I did the memorial service, complete with readings and him or two, little, little sermon. You know, I mean, I, I was pulling this stuff out pretty quick as this was, <laughs> as this was happening. So Misty and, I, Misty and I are heading back to our house. And I was saying, what, what was he thinking? She said, he must have just known that you cared enough that he didn't even have to exactly ask you. He just knew you would come through. Now, I, honestly, I don't know if that's true or not. But I do know this, that we have people who have a lot of adversity, a lot of adversity. And they need to know they have a leader that they can come to. Now, you don't have to solve all their problems. Sometimes they just need someone to talk to. Sometimes they do need a referral someplace, and sometimes you can solve it. But if we have genuine concern for our people, they will sense that. And they will know we are approachable when, when, when the time comes. So leadership is influence, and a lot of that influence occurs because of the channel of love. The second thing is, is our people want to feel special and valuable. The third thing is, is our people want to receive feedback in an atmosphere of genuine concern. And fourth, our people want to know they have someone they can approach when they have adversity. Okay, so how do we do this? I, you might be following and say, okay, I, I, I kind of see where you're going, but how do you do this? How, how, what, do you just turn the switch? How do you do this love thing? Well, I'll tell you what we don't do. We, we don't bring our platoon together on the first day or our division or our section or whatever it is and say, okay, everyone get real close. Everyone in. I, I'm Lieutenant Athens. I'm the new, come on in, real close. Okay. I just want to tell you all, gosh, I just love you all. I, I just want you to know I love you. I'll love you as long as I, your platoon crew. Okay, go, go to work. Go. <laughs> Obviously, you're not going to do that. So how do you do it? And I've learned over time that there's two things that we have to have about us. One is an attribute and one is an action. One is an attribute and one is an action. The first one is an attribute. And interestingly enough, I